Good morning, Oaks family, and all of you who are part of our Oaks family during all this COVID-19 hunkering down, sheltering in place stuff that's going on. Can you believe it? it's Monday morning? Wow. And we're moving right into May uh, already. Uh, anyway, I, I, I'm backwards and uh, just... Like I said last night, my scar is not on my left. I can't get my camera to reverse right without it going wacky. And uh, so, anyway, uh, had quite an issue uh, when that happened first. I'm not sure what all, there uh, last was Saturday, my last time, uh, you know, and uh, some of you thought my face looked crooked, and next thing you know, I'm being diagnosed with Bell's palsy. <laughs> and. Woo! You know, you get paranoia when somebody says that about you. The next thing you know, you think, oh, golly, what, what is wrong? Yeah, I think my face does feel a little bit numb now that I think about it. And so John Lindell, uh, he diagnosed me and everything. We think I'm all right. Uh, or maybe I just have a tooth that's going to get bad or something. We're not sure what all is going on there. And then I start spitting a little bit. And that, people are thinking, whoa, what's going on? I don't know what's going on. I do not know. Uh, anyway, I know I'm wearing the same clothes uh, that I wear a lot. And you know, they say that we we wear 20% of our wardrobe 80% of the time. I wear 10% uh, uh, of my wardrobe 90% of the time. That's just the way it is. You know, uh, I have things I like. That's what I wear. Occasionally I get something new. Not all that often, though, to be honest with you. And it's cold out today. So I had to get dressed back up. Anyway, uh, what else? Romans. Well, we'll talk about Romans here in a minute. But i got to show you a couple things. I hope you are uh, taking your bottle tree seriously because judgment is a big deal. And Paul, really right out the gate in Romans, that is uh, something he wants to address big time. And so... We take it very seriously because this is his systematic theology, and it's his uh, what crown jewel, so to speak. So you know, we we want to take that really, really seriously. He sees that as a huge deal, and so let's do the same. Amen. Amen. And to that end, I have a picture for you, and this is a happy thought. Never thought that judgment would be a happy thought, but getting away from judgment is a happy thought. And again, this is going to be backwards, but probably you won't know the difference. That is my path uh, out here at our house. And that's that's my short path. I got two paths, but that's my cross that's out there. And uh, there's our first bottle on it, hanging that I put on there. That bottle is for me and Joni both. Uh, that's a common deal that she and I, uh, as, soon as, as soon as I got home yesterday, she mentioned it and said, yep, we need to take care of that one. Uh, that's We've been judgmental there. Stop. And so we got that bottle every time I see it, every time she sees it, because uh, you can see it from our house even. That'll be a reminder uh, about that one. Stop that one. Over. Done. Okay? Judgment in that one, don't do it. Okay. Hope you got your little bottle tree. I know there's a few people out there that said they're going to hang some bottles. So wherever you do that, if it works for you, however it works for you, God bless you with it. And pray that at the Oaks, we will not be known ever for our judgment of other people. Amen. Amen. And I got to show you one more. Because, you know, finding one mushroom really, I mean, it's really a letdown. Unless it's one like that size right there. And then it's kind of fun, uh, no matter what. That's a big honker. And uh, so, anyway, wanted to show you, sometimes just one mushroom is, is a blessing too, right? Amen? Yes. Well, it's time to tackle, guess what, and where we are. Romans chapter 3. Romans is not only... Uh, God's masterpiece. But Romans 3 is probably the cherry on top of the masterpiece. 
And I believe it was Romans chapter 3 that led to the total transformation and uh, conversion, genuine conversion of uh, Martin Luther and the whole Reformation, you could say, based on this chapter. Be assured, I'm not even going to phase it because I'm not, I'm not Martin Luther and I don't have the brain power that they have to just... Uh, and Paul, wow, just the level of anointing that he that was on him when he wrote chapter 3. Uh, but I can't, that can't stop me, right? As a pastor, we just got to go for it. So I'll, I'll take a shot at it with you. And uh, you can do a whole lot more reading and research yourself. And probably uh, Luther, I don't know how long he preached on Romans 3. I'll bet he spent many, many, many weeks on it. We're going to spend maybe 30 minutes, okay? So, let's, well, before that, let's pray, which I always forget, don't I? I've already prayed once, though. I've already been to my prayer altar praying, God help me, Holy Spirit help me. Uh, but let's pray again for all of us together. Father, in the name of Jesus, our greatest need as we study your word is for your Holy Spirit and to be in us and to fill us so that we can listen, so that we can truly be taught the truth of your beautiful word, to be sanctified as you taught us uh, through Christ that we're sanctified by your word. Pray for that today and just to draw that word, just meaning drawing us, consecrating us more to you making us more and more holy, more and more in love and in line with your will and way for us this day. Help us get through Romans 3 to that end. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Let's go for it. Okay, uh, the end of Romans 2 is, is pretty cool. I mean, we looked at the, the judgment, uh, don't do it yesterday, and that takes us over to 11 uh, then on down, and then the condemnation through the law. Uh, I love the end of it. I almost preached on the end uh, of Romans 2, where he talks about circumcision. And uh, he says that uh, he is physically uncircumcised. If he keeps the law, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law. Uh, well, let me keep going here. Verse 28. He is not a Jew who is one... There's what I'm looking for. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart. I kind of wanted to preach on that, but I didn't. By the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men but from God. Okay, so there's a good one on circumcision. And uh, that lets everybody in, men and women, right? Because it's of the heart. Hallelujah. Uh, now, Paul, uh, and this is going to be very complicated, you guys, so we're just going to work our way through it. And uh, that's the way it's going to be. I'll do my best. Uh, but he's going to start out, my heading is all the world guilty. Everybody is guilty. He's going to set that up in the first 20 verses so that we get to the end, to 21 through 31, the last 11 verses here, so that all can be acquitted of their guilt uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? So let's just go for it here, uh, kind of a verse at a time. Okay, then, now this is coming right off of the circumcision thing here, circumcision of the heart. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? The benefit of being a Jew. Great in every, aspect, every respect, Paul says. First of all, that they were entrusted with the oracles of God. And what a trust that is. Uh, a, a trust for uh, what? Uh, 1,500 years uh, or longer? Uh, and, to, and even if you're reaching back into Genesis, uh, they have been entrusted with br bringing God's uh, salvation to this point. And the law has, a, in, has an essential uh, place in bringing us to the point where we realize our guilt and our need uh, for acquittal 
through Christ, and that the law can't do that. All it can do is basically declare us guilty. But they've been entrusted with that, uh, with that journey uh, to this point for these 1,500 years or plus. What then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God with it. And basically, he's kind of just saying, you know, all of us should realize it that the law has led all you Jews, all of us Jews, Paul's one, has led us to the point where, you know, well, I can't do this. I'm get, the only way I could get to, to, to God is, is, is my faith. Uh, because the law, I can't do it. Everybody, he's basically saying everybody should have got that, really. So Paul's suggesting then, if some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God. Well, it may it never be. Rather, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar, as it is written. So, uh, again, kind of complicated. And I can't untangle it all very well for you, sorry to say. That you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. And that's uh, Psalm 51, and you can go back and look at that. Uh, okay. But if our righteousness, verse 5, and here we got the word righteousness, and let's get the things that we know that we certainly can get, and that righteousness, a right relationship with God. Our, uh, but if our unrighteousness, which means that we are not in a right relationship with God, the law has led, a, led every Jew to understand, I'm not in a right relationship with him because I can't obey all this. I mean, I just have to, uh, and Paul set that up. It's the same for us. We're, in it. We're unrighteous because of sin. Sin separates us from God. If our unrighteousness, and that's the Jew, and he's talking about himself now, but it's also for us, a Gentile, demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I'm speaking in human terms, kind of suggesting that, well, if the law can't get us there, then nothing can. So how could I be judged? But, of course, that's not true because Christ has come. And that's where Paul's going to come to. The unrighteousness, our unrighteousness can be taken care of. Verse 6, may it never be. Otherwise... How will God judge the world? He couldn't judge the world if we're all guilty and we have no other, no hope of be, being of acquittal. But if through my lie the truth of God abounded for to His glory, why am I also still being judged as a sinner? I don't understand that verse very well. Uh, I tried. Uh, let's move on. Okay, uh, verse eight, and I could blabber on about it, but I won't probably help you. Verse eight. Why not say? As we are slanderously reported, and as some claim that we say, let us, do, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. So in other words, yeah, just, hey, the more, obviously we're sinners, we can't obey all these laws, let's just break them all. And then more good could come uh, through God. Their condemnation is just. That's cheap grace. Paul does not talk about, Paul's not into cheap grace. Uh, he's not going to say, he's ever going to say, even when Christ comes, just go and live like hell. Don't matter. You got it all uh, taken care of, all right? Verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? And here are the Jews better than Gentiles. Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. And now he's going to go on quite quite the Old Testament uh, uh, deal here. Uh, he's going to quote Psalm 5, 14, 53, 10, 36, 140, Proverbs 1, Ecclesiastes 7, and Isaiah 59. And they're all going to be bad. He's, this is what the Jews call stringing pearls. And that's why I love to string pearls when I preach. And when I do that, it's just I'm citing other texts that help reinforce uh, the text that I'm preaching on. It's scripture interpreting scripture. The Jewish, the rabbis did that all the time, citing other scriptures that bolster the scripture that they're looking at and just showing us the unity and harmony of the Holy Spirit inspiring the word. And I just think it's beautiful. And some people have told me not to do it. I said, no, no, no. 
And in fact, I've heard, there, there's a certain denomination that never encourages you to do that. I'm saying, no way, man. I'm going to string pearls when I get a chance. I love spring, string them. And in this passage, Paul is stringing black pearls. Listen to him. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is, mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That is stringing black pearls, if there ever was a, an example of it in all of Scripture. They're black pearls, but they're beautiful because they serve a wonderful purpose. Never underrate or underestimate our sinfulness. Never, ever. But it sets up Paul for never underestimate or underrate the power of Jesus Christ to cleanse you from all of that. Your throat, your mouth, your feet, your paths, your eyes, and anything else that you can think of. Throw it in there. As objects of our sinfulness and our ability uh, to commit sin. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, and it is just spoken and said, from what Paul's quoted, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. And those verses right there should shut every mouth and close every mouth and know, uh, know that, that, that we are accountable to God and we are guilty. Verse 20, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Yeah, amen. I want to say a word about justified because we're going to see these words are going to really start rolling here uh, now in these verses. The word righteous is the word dikaiosune. To make righteous is the word dikaiao. These are all in the same family. And that's the word justify. Justify is the word dikaiao. Okay, so to justify means what? To be made righteous. That would be a perfect translation here if it wasn't so wordy. Because of the works of the law, no flesh will be made righteous. No, and then we can go farther with it. No flesh will be put into a right relationship with God because of works of the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. See, the purpose of the law is the knowledge of sin. And it really is to this day. The purpose of the law is the knowledge of sin and to know that we are sinners, that we are unrighteous, that we are separated from God, and we need to be justified. We need to be put into right, we long to be, I hope, a right, be put into a right relationship with God. So this now introduces kind of a, a courtroom setting. And that's maybe why I have so much trouble with it, is just the court. And I know some people love this type of language and thinking and all that. And but I never thought I wanted to be a lawyer, so I guess that's why I don't. I, I have it's hard. But here, let's go to court. Are you ready to go to court? Okay, we're gonna go to court. We've set it up. Guilty, right? Everybody, you can say that to yourself right now. I am guilty. The law declares me guilty because I can't obey hardly any of this stuff. Not with my throat, my tongue, my mouth, uh, my eyes. Uh, anything else? Okay. Verse 21. And my heading is justification by faith. Justification means to be put into a right relationship with God, a righteous relationship with God. And Paul says, by faith. That's the only way forward for us. Now, Paul says, apart from the law, the righteousness of God, God's desire in his, in his being... To be relational. And he is relational. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
but his relationalness with us, with his creation, those who created him, male and female. And it was very good because they were in a right relationship with him to begin with, Adam and Eve, but they sinned, they got separated, they become unrighteous, okay? Apart from the law now, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. See, uh, Paul says that the, the, pro the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, has testified now uh, that we're not righteous, but even the law and the prophets testify that we can be righteous. And it, it's by faith, just as Abraham by faith. He was responding uh, to all that he knew. And everybody from then on, every Jew, can still can do that. Okay? But we don't love God enough. We don't love our neighbor enough, which Jesus said was the summation of the law and the prophets. Right? We fail in that every day. Yesterday, we really hit hard on we don't love ne our neighbor like we're supposed to. And that's what our bottles are. Pop them up, you put them up on the tree, but it's a failure almost. It's not exclusively. We don't love God enough either. Uh, we fail him just in the simplest of things. Uh, 10 plus 10. Golly, who doesn't have time to do that? Who doesn't have 20 minutes just to give an expression of love to God every day? Well, we don't. A lot of people don't. Uh, but then our neighbors as well. All right. Okay. Where am I here? Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So the law and the prophets should tell us that, you know, we can't be saved by words. Even the righteousness of God. Oh, that's where we were. Uh, God's desire for a right relationship. Through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. Wow, is that packed? And uh, here it is. This is everything kind of tucked in, put together in one verse. The righteousness of God, getting into a right relationship with God, comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Transfer your trust to Jesus Christ, not in the law. For all, I want to be all, I hope you want to be all, all those who believe, believe, just a transfer of trust. Believe, for there is no distinction, Paul's saying now. Jew or Greek, doesn't Gentile, doesn't matter. This is how everybody gets into a right relationship with God. Faith in Jesus Christ. Believe in him. And then verse 23, one that I, you know, I quote, I've quoted hundreds and hundreds of times over the years as your pastor. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've already established that, really, because we've read. And so now Paul can just say it here in just, what, eight or nine or ten words. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're in. You're in. I'm in. I've fallen short. 24. Being justified. What's that mean? being put into a right relationship with God as a gift. Free, can't earn it, can't obey enough laws. It is a gift. It is, it is a gift of his grace. His grace, grace what? Charis, that's the word, unmerited favor. Okay, nothing I earned, nothing I did. Here's another big word coming by his grace, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And redemption just simply means to be set free. You're a prisoner. You've been set free. My favorite verse, one of my favorite verses, you know, Ephesians 1 and 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. In him we've been set free through his blood. Through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25. Whom God displayed publicly. Here's another big word. As a propitiation in his blood through faith. Propitiation means to satisfy, uh, to have uh, uh, paid the price that is required. And he did it in his blood through faith. I mean, this is just really a lot of words here piled on top of each other that you probably could study uh, the rest of the week and not get to the bottom of it but it's beautiful if we just listen to it kind of go with it try to simplify it a little bit god displayed publicly that's jesus hanging on the cross publicly before everyone as a propitiation just said there's the price that is paid he's paid it and it's paid in full remember that word to tell us he paid it all and it's satisfied that's propitiation as best i can understand it and he did it in his blood. As his blood ran down his body and dripped in a pool at the base of the cross, it's paid. And there's enough blood there for every one of us. 
that it can, that it can cover and cleanse us. That's propitiation in his blood through faith. Faith just means the transfer of my trust into Jesus Christ and what he did there on the cross as I look at him. He is paying, he is satisfying the wrath of God through his blood. Hallelujah. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Demonstrating God's incredible loving desire to be in a right relationship with his people who are sinners and separated from him. So he's made the way where there seemed to be no way. He made a way through Christ. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. That is just an incredible statement from Paul. The way I understand it with my simple mind is he was able to pass over the sins of all the people before because if he had to look at them as sinners, he would just zap them dead, gone, over with. But since God does not exist in time, he knew that his son Jesus Christ in the fullness of time, in the Kairos moment, was coming. And he was going to pay the price for our sins in his body on the cross through his blood. And, and God could do forbearance, could see that one day the blood of my son Jesus is going to go back all the way through and cover everybody. And see, since time is not, he doesn't exist, in he could see that. And now we look at it as forbearance, his forbearance, being able to pass over those sins committed in the past, knowing that Christ his son would come and could cover them all. And somehow knowing those who would exercise faith in Jesus Christ. It's a God thing. It's not our thing. Verse 27. Where then is boasting? There's no boasting. Oh my gosh. Who can boast? You know, I heard a guy, a preacher, a famous preacher on the radio one day, and his announcer that's his buddy that interviews him after he preaches every session and says to him, how long do you spend preparing a sermon like suggesting such an incredible exposition of the word? And he answers back, rather than saying, oh my, I got nothing except what the Holy Spirit gives me. Nothing. Instead of saying that, he goes, ah, uh, I don't know. I probably spend about 11 to 12 hours in my study. Basically saying, preparing this incredible word for you all. Oh my gosh. Where is boasting? There is no boasting. It doesn't matter who you are or how high you've seemingly risen in the preaching, what, pantheon of God. Help us, God, help us never to do that. Well, Paul says it's excluded. By what kind of law of works? No. But by a law of faith. This is the only occurrence of the law of faith in the entire New Testament. But of course it would be because Paul has just railed against the law um, of just the Jewish faith, the Torah. He's railed against it. Not, he's not railed against it. I say that wrong. But he's railed against the fact that the Jews try and claim that as a way that gets them into right standing with God. Because you can't, right? How many times have I said that already? And instead now he's used the law. It's a law of faith. No, it's not a law of uh, it's the law of faith that gets us into right, not a law of works, you guys. And of course, it can still it can be that way for us as well. We can be just as guilty uh, as followers of Christ now as we get on. And, and you know, it's so natural for us to start thinking that we're racking up our good works, and is somehow earning us something, uh, as, uh, earning us something in regard to our uh, our salvation. It, it's not. It cannot. It's only. Uh, by faith uh, and grace and through Jesus Christ. Never go there. Golly, don't go there. 
We've, we'll talk more about deeds as we move on uh, as Paul's works, but he, there's a place for them, absolutely, as an expression of love uh, to, to, to Christ and following him, and also of reward, quite honestly. But it has nothing to do with our salvation and the forgiveness of our sins. Period. Amen. Or is God the God of Jews only, justified by faith, apart from works uh, of the law? Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? And uh, Paul's established that absolutely yes, of Gentiles also. And hopefully every Jew can embrace that because there's proselytizing Jew or uh, proselyte Jews. I don't know if I call the right word or not. Proselytes, I think they are called Gentiles who have followed the Jews. So, you know, they've invited people. In. They know that. They surely would agree with that. Yes, he's Gentiles too. Verse 30, since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. And they know he's one. Deuteronomy 6, the Lord our God, he is one. And he works as one God with all people. He doesn't treat anybody differently. That's what Paul is saying. And, and he's treating us as Jews, he's saying. I'm a Jew. He's treating me the same. I have to come by faith. You do too, Jews. Gentiles, you do too. Everybody does. He won't have two standards. God doesn't have two standards for anybody. Verse 31. Do we then nullify the law through faith? And that is the question. That is the ultimate question at the end. May it never be, Paul says. Meganoita. I always love that word. Meganoita. On the contrary, we establish the law. And brothers and sisters, establishing of the law that Paul has just done is that we can't get into a right relationship with God, a righteous relationship. We can't be justified, uh, made right before God by works of the law. We can't do it. You got the law on the wrong side of salvation if you think it comes before. Well, it does come before, just convicting us. But it has a wonderful purpose even after. And we'll talk more about that as well. Just seeing uh, the ways that God longs for his people uh, to walk and obey. But you can't get there uh, by... I want to I simplify, for me, three words, big words, that we've talked about. And the first one is justification. Okay, Big word, made right with God. We are guilty. And so these are, these are courtroom words, okay? Because that's kind of what Paul's just done. We just went to court, okay? We went as absolutely 100% guilty people. But we're going to get acquitted through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus. So we're guilty, but declared innocent by faith in Jesus Christ. That's called justification, okay? We are imprisoned, but set free by faith in Jesus Christ. That's called redemption. That's the second big word that we looked at. The third big word, we are penniless, but we're bailed out by faith in Jesus Christ. That's propitiation. I want to end with what uh, Eugene Peterson says in, his, in the Message Bible. This little, the version I have has a little bit of his commentary in it. He says this at the end of Romans 3. The judge stepped down from the judgment seat, removed his courtly robes, took our guilt upon himself, and served our sentence by dying in our place. The result? Justice is served. Case closed. We're free. And we never have to worry about being tried in that courtroom again. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God for justification by faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a little bit of time studying a great, big, giant, beautiful chapter. And uh, thank you for Paul. Golly. The anointing that you gave him to pack all of that in those 31 verses. 
I pray that we got a few nuggets of the beauty of your gospel, the breadth of your gospel, and the absolute assurance of your gospel that we uh, have been justified, we have been redeemed, and we have been propitiated, satisfied every requirement that you had for us, and that we walk this day never again in that courtroom, but free, free indeed, through you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. And hope to see you tonight, 7 o'clock. We'll do our little Jesus calling. Love y'all.